All right, good friends. Welcome back. Tom Crowley, INN World Report Radio, Tuesday nights and Thursday nights here on the great Logos Radio Network. That was the theme song from the BBC, you know, the British Empire's network television program, The Avengers from the 1960s. We have our own INN World Report Radio Avenger on the program with us tonight, Dr. Webster Griffin Tarpley. Always uh, a pleasure to have him on the show. I'm going to get right down to it. Dr. Topley, thanks for coming on. And uh, I, uh, well, first of all, thanks for coming on. Thank you. And I, I'm looking forward to getting the link to the show, right? You do tape it all, right? Absolutely. The archives are there. Okay. And your guy on your website is on top of it. And he always posts it on your tarpley.net, friends. Tarpley.net. I didn't have time to talk to him this afternoon. Absolutely. He, he knows. He's smart. Tarpley.net, not just every uh, every visit that Dr. Tarpley has had on this show is on there, but so much more information. Now, uh, Webster, I have been saying it for weeks and weeks and weeks on this show. The Balkans, the Crimea, you know, the the, the old Khazar Empire, the, the, the you know, the confluence between, you know, the, the Ottoman Turkish Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Prussian Empire, the Russian Empire, the Poles, everything. It's all going on again. It seems to me, I feel like we're, we're in a similar kind of a situation, albeit modernized, as it was uh, prior to World War One. Am I nuts? No, I think this is an impression that many of us have had, and and, and I thank you for uh, for your work in in putting that line out because the, the similarities are chilling. The problem is that there are very few people left who have had any education in this. Right? There's nobody who's lived through it. They're all dead, and then the sort of um, the ones who might understand the co- the comparisons are uh, relatively few and far between. So let me just try to uh, remind people what we're talking about. It was on the 28th of June, 1914, that we had these assassinations of the Austrian heir to the imperial throne in Vienna and his wife. They were killed in Sarajevo, part of Bosnia-Herzegovina, at that time under uh, the rule of Austria, not just their administration, but annexed in uh, 1908 or 1909. Uh, So that was the detonator. But then there's a period of about a month of generally secret diplomatic activity, uh, which leads then to a declaration of war. The first declaration of war was on July 28th, exactly one month later, and that's Austro-Hungarian Empire declaring war against uh, Serbia. And then very quickly we get the mobilizations of the main powers, and of course in those days to activate your mobilization army, not just your standing army, but call in, you know, five or ten years' worth of draftees and get them all into one big mass and hurl them at the frontier. That was the equivalent of war. Nobody mobilized without the firm expectation that war was then almost um, inevitable. And I would just, I would point to uh, one or two things about the British role Above all, but that maybe just to clear the decks. Um, if you look at books about this, right, like the Sleepwalkers by Clark, or you can read uh, the books by uh, Keegan, who was a fairly well-known military historian, or a number of others. Um, there's also a German school that unfortunately says this: Fritz Fischer, Emanuel Geis. They try to say that it was uh, always Berlin trying to convince Vienna to go to war, right? That they needed to attack Serbia, Belgrade, uh, and crush uh, Serbia. And there is a lot to that, but you have to remember. Well, well, actually, um, Webster, can I ask you a deeper question first? Um, Let me ask you something. You know, my brief study of history, albeit nothing like yours, if you look at all the history books, it's like an accident waiting to happen. You know, all this happenstance, all this circumstance, and some legitimate lone wolf crazy guy who wants to have independence, blah, blah, blah. That's the historical version. Isn't it more like that the guy who killed uh, the Archduke was, you know, Lee Harvey bin Laden? Well, yes, uh, but here's the thing. It takes it, it essentially takes three three components. The first is you've got to have this system of alliances. In other, in particular, you've got to have 
what's known as the Triple Entente, which is Great Britain plus France plus Russia. And each one of those has to have a treaty, military treaty, naval convention, something like this, each one with the other. It, this is not a public alliance, but it's a convergence. And above all, there's a secret system of military conventions, pledges, war plans that have been agreed on by the general staffs and by the, the admiralties of these countries. And that is the personal creation of King Edward VII of Great Britain. Take a look at topfree.net. Scroll back a little bit to the end of July. If it's not on the front page anymore, I don't know. But you'll see there this, this lecture that I gave in 1995, which is all about King Edward VII, known as Edward the Encircler. Uh, the Encircler, because he successfully encircled uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary. What it meant was that in, in case of a war, there would be uh, essentially Germany, Austria-Hungary in the middle of things would be faced by Britain and France in the West, Russia in the East, and as, in addition by Italy and Serbia in the South. And Italy, of course, was uh, theoretically an ally of Germany and Austria. So they had been detached under the influence of King Edward VII. So can, King can I ask you a quick question is, about that? Wait, website? he's the personal, the personal author. His idea, his diplomacy, his visits, his arrangements. Edward VII is the beginning and end of war guilt when it comes to creating the preconditions, although he died uh, in 1910, just a little bit before the war began. Right. But you know what? Something else stands out in stark contrast to me about this uh, alignment that you just spoke of. And tell me if I'm correct, but uh, in your triple entente, let's start with Great Britain, of course. You've got an empire that's all over the world, okay? The French, they've got an empire not as great, perhaps, as the British, but also all over the world, you know, Southeast Asia, North Africa, okay, Haiti, formerly, okay, places like that. Um, the Russians, mm, I don't know that they got an empire all over the world, but they're so damn big that, you know, it might as well be, okay, versus the Prussians and the Austro-Hungarians, comparatively speaking, how global are the empires of, of Prussia and Austria-Hungary yeah. compared to the Triple Entente? Well, they're, they're not. Um, so I think that, that really doesn't get us anywhere there in terms of causality. The causality requires, first of all, this triple entente. And I, I think it has something to do with system. containment. Containment. All right. Well, Go ahead. encirclement, right? The word was encirclement. Edward the encircler is the guy. But that once you've got that all set up, uh, which he does by the time that he dies, he also leaves behind a generation of people that are his puppets, his protégés, his uh, network. And this is Izvolsky, the most powerful figure in Russian foreign policy. And then we have Théophile Delcasse, the most powerful figure in French foreign policy. You've also got politicians like Poincaré, the president of France in 1914, and Clemenceau, who then becomes prime minister of France later on. The importance of them is... That these are people, especially on the French side, that Edward VII assembled. He was uh, essentially scheming for about 50 years, right? From about 1860 until his death in 1910, he was assembling this network, which was going to be the network that he unleashed against the strategic challenger to Great Britain. And that very quickly turned out to be Prussia and or uh, Germany. So he's also got... With the Turks uh, thrown in, Jackie maybe. Jackie Fisher, Jackie Fisher at the British Admiralty, and and Lord Grey, very important guy. Got to talk about him. But then, then as you say, we've got Sarajevo, the trigger, uh, the trigger. What I've shown, and I maybe not on your show, but on my, on other programs and above all on my own, that uh, we had people in London who were eagerly waiting for the news from Sarajevo on this fateful Sunday, Saint Vitus Day. Uh, June 28, 1914. They're waiting and they're saying, hey, have you heard anything from Sarajevo yet? Did the news come in? Did they blow it so, or did they make it happen? So, sounds like the BBC and, in New and, York on 9-11 with uh, um, Building 7. We've also got a similar reports of people in St. Petersburg waiting even a day or two before 
the visit of the Archduke. They're wondering, has he been assassinated? So there's, there's a good case that people in Paris, as well as in, in the Russian capital, were aware that his assassination was imminent. And, and indeed, the guy who does the killing, this Gabriel Princip, he's a member of this uh, young Bosnia. Now, as soon as I say young, you've got to remember what this is. Giovane Italia. Right, young Italy, Mazzini, right, Giuseppe Mazzini, who is a paid agent of the British Admiralty, and there's no way around it. And then we have young France, young Germany, we have young America, Franklin Pierce, and some Confederates were part of the young America. There's even a town in Minnesota by this name. So uh, you look or look at these uh, these networks. They're well aware that an assassination is imminent. So I, I think we have every reason to assert that uh, an assassination was planned. And the, the people doing this are these Freemasonic lodges, and that is pretty much the Edward the Seventh network. And when you say Freemasonry in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, what you mean is the Edward the Seventh uh, networks. Okay. So those two well, things. Indeed, weren't there multiple assassinations planned that day? Wasn't there an earlier try that same day that failed, or within a day or two? Yeah, but that's we, we can only blame that on the unbelievable, uh, either ineptitude or probably the fact that the uh, the security for this poor Franz Ferdinand and his wife was uh, was uh, penetrated. Right, that they were eager to get him killed. That's so you don't you don't think that one attempt was related to the other? They were totally separate. No, they're, they're the same people. But, of course, Thank any competent security would have gotten them the hell out of there immediately, right? Out, right. gone, gone in a cloud of dust. But, no, he stayed. He wanted to go to the hospital to give condolences and uh, to visit the wounded, and then he got himself killed, right? But, again, Gavrilo Princip, young Bosnia, that's a British ultra-nationalist uh, network, and there are also then inputs from this thing called the black hand of Colonel Apis. Colonel Apis Dimitrievich is a member of the Serbian general staff, and he's in contact with the Russian ambassador Hardwick and the Russian military attaché Artomonov. So they're all part of this. Uh, well, this hold on. we got to go on break, but, but it's all eerily uh, similar to all of this NGO democracy right, stuff third, from Harvard. The third hold on. We'll, we'll be right back component. with Dr. Tarpley right after this. Hey friends, welcome back. We're going to get right back to it. Dr. Webster Tarpley in the house. Uh, Tarpley.net. All right. You go there. You hear his other broadcasts. You hear this broadcast. And, and of course, his great writings all there. Tarpley.net. Uh, if you don't go anywhere else that we talk about on this show, that would be a great place to start. All right. So, uh, Dr. Tarpley, back to, you know, I've said it for weeks on this show. It is eerily reminiscent right now of the the, the factors that were involved in, in the start of World War One. You mentioned these young uh, Serbs. I'm thinking Gene Sharp and all this stupid, uh, you know, color revolution stuff. You know, the getting the young kids. Yes. I'm, I'm thinking that it's, it's here. It is. It's all you've got the old oligarchies button up against the new oligarchies. Containment, China containment, Austria, Prussian containment. You know, it's all there, isn't it? Remember that the slogan in the 19th century was "England supports all revolutions but her own," and it's sort of the. It's US the only place that never had a real revolution, and they paid for everybody else's on the continent, didn't they? Well, they they had something back in the 1600s. We can go into that, but mm-hmm. we can't do Cromwell tonight. Let me just point to the, a new document, okay, which has now come to light, which changes the view on some of this stuff, uh, much to the detriment of the British once again. Um, but you got to let me set this up now. We got to talk about Earl Grey. Lord Grey was the British Foreign Secretary. His I enjoy his tea was, every morning. There we go. Remember, Edward the Seventh is a cigar, and Earl Grey is a tea bag. So <laughs> these people have lived on. They have. Um, the question now is Earl Grey. His father was a house servant of Edward the Seventh. He was a horse. Uh, groom, right? An equerry, something a stable like jockey. So, stable jockey. Uh, so this is a relatively humble origins. But the guy becomes foreign secretary, and he becomes uh, later remember, you know, peer, House of Lords. So how did he do this? 
this is the great exercise in duplicity. I got to talk about three or four different moments with this. Because this is what emerges then. Once everybody in the continent is locked in war, by the time you get to um, August 1st, 1914, a couple of days ago, in the anniversary. The guns of August. The guns of August. Everybody in the continent is at war. They've either, either mobilized or they're at war. And the big question is, what will Britain do? And they had been pretending that they would be neutral. Oh, my God, I've got a dog here who's giving me a hard time. Excuse me. This no, it's fine. We love dogs. Uh, take your time I with the dog. Love dogs. Um, here we go. All right. So that's the end of that dog. Um, now, um, Earl Grey, Britain pretending forward. to be, British, Britain playing coy. They, play, they pretended to be mediators, that they were a disinterested party. And they, they were, uh, essentially, they came up with four different methods to mediate the crisis. All the while, they were preparing to attack, because they were going to come in on the side of France and Russia. And here's the interesting thing. Earl Grey had two alternatives, and this is actually stated by various people. There's a Russian source who says it, a German source who says it, so both sides. And Earl Grey had two choices. If he wanted to avoid war, what could he have done? He could have said to the Germans at the very beginning, don't attack Serbia, because if there's a war, we're coming in on the side of Britain and France, and you'll be in the soup. So make sure it doesn't happen. That would have been one. <laughs> that would have forced Germany to tell Austria Hungary, forget it, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna get anything this time around. You know? Or they could have called another... the British bluff. Would be they did a pretty good job of beating Britain up before the United States joined that war, no? Well, yeah, but this this is a tragedy for civilization. I mean there's there's no and this is all useless. It's all futile, right? It it, it doesn't help anybody. The other alternative is because we're interested in war avoidance. I know I am. The other, the other I know that, but the oligarchs are gamblers when they, when they face an existential threat, as they perceive it. All right, then you have to tell France and Russia. Edward Gray could have said to them, look, uh, stay out of war, because if you get into a war, you're on your own. We're not going to help you. We're not going to come on the continent and bail you out of your lunatic policies. So what you see is, unfortunately, there's a group in every capital that wants a war somehow. The group in Vienna wants a war where Austria rolls over Serbia, and that's the extent of it, nothing more. The group in Russia wants a world war because they want to conquer the Straits, Constantinople, right, the Bosporus and the Dardanelles. The group in France wants a general European war in order to get uh, Alsace-Lorraine, at least that's how they put it. Uh, the group in Germany really, they want... They don't want to lose Austria-Hungary. That's really the way I would put it. They don't want Austria-Hungary to leave them in the lurch, and then they're all alone, completely encircled with nothing. But the group in Britain wants a world war for the purpose of destroying Germany as a strategic, economic, financial, geopolitical competitor in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe, all over the world. Where, now, where they don't have... So many colonies yet, but maybe they're starting to function like the Chinese are functioning now, uh, giving uh, their s subservient people a, a better deal. I wouldn't. I wouldn't see it in terms of colonies so much. It's just that the German uh, uh, industrial, scientific, technical capabilities were surging ahead, and for the British, this was a challenge they could have met. This is always the interesting thing. The British could very easily have matched many of those German achievements, but it would have required a change in the social order. It would have right. required a career open to talent, to ability. It would have required a meritocracy instead yeah. of this lunatic aristocracy that Absolutely. they have had and, and to some right. degree still have. Right. Right now, the new, the what's new, right? So Edward Gray, on August 3rd, Edward Gray, I urge people to go and read the speech in the House of Edward Commons. Edward Gray or Edward yeah. Earl Gray? He's Earl Edward Gray. I mean, first okay. he's Sir Edward Gray, and then he becomes Lord Gray, Earl Gray, whatever you want, right? Okay. He becomes a peer. You've got to remember, every British has three names. Huh? huh? 
Okay. William right. Petty. William Petty becomes the uh, Earl of Lansdowne, and then he becomes Lord Shelburne. So you go from Petty to Shelburne, no, to, to, to Lansdowne to Shelburne, right? Watch out. Right. This, the British are always a moving target. It's very hard to catch up with these guys once they get going. But now, the speech in the House of Commons on August 3rd is a masterpiece of duplicity. Unbelievable. But he's got to convince the House of Commons, that they've got to help France and Russia. At the same time, he's got to convince them that there are no secret agreements that actually bind them. So he's got to say, you should support the war. You should go to war, but nothing to do with you. And you should do it uh, to honor secret agreements which do not exist. (laughs) (laughs) Secret agreements whose names I cannot mention. Which which I which don't exist because the, theoretically they don't exist. Now here's what we found. King As Monty George Python would say, fifth. nod nod wink wink. I suppose King George V is the son of Edward the Seventh. Okay, by this time, by the time we get to 1914, Edward has been dead for three or four years, and his son George V is on the throne. Now we have to realize that George V was theoretically not supposed to be the first uh, of his sons to get the throne. Because he's the second son. He's not the oldest son. The oldest son was this other guy called Prince Eddie, who died in the 1880s. And the short uh, version on Prince Eddie is that he is the principal suspect to be Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper son of Edward VII. Is and I've very, heard that fascinating. But likely. listen, the, the, the vicissitudes, the tides and the eddies of this show means we got to take a break. We'll be right back with Eddie right. after this. Welcome back. Tom Kiley, INN World Report Radio. That's Webb Satarkley muttering under his breath in the background. He's just chomping at the bit to get back to it. And I don't I don't uh, blame him because it's really, really fascinating. Uh, we're talking about uh, fortuitously, friends, for several reasons. First of all, as you've heard me say on this show many times over the last few weeks, I feel the world is in a very, very precarious situation. We've got the rebirth of the Cold War disgustingly. All right, we've got the neocons chomping at the bit for it. We just heard Dr. Tarpley talking about the neocons from 100 years ago who were chomping at the bit for war. Okay, and we, we've got all of that, that happening right now. And there's been, you know, of course, it's the, you know, the beginning of August, the guns of August, the beginning of World War, II, World War One, a hundred years ago. Doctor Tarpley, haven't there been some like new documents? And and how is Europe, by the way, marking this horrible, horrible anniversary? Well, we every country has their own view of when it started, and some countries are ignoring it. I think Germany is not paying much attention, perhaps for obvious reasons, but uh, the British. And the Belgians consider August 3rd, that is to say, uh, yesterday, well, the day before yesterday now, right? August 3rd is the day they consider to be the opening guns. And that's because that's when Germany entered Belgium on the 3rd of August. And uh, the British then seized upon that, Sir Edward Grey seized upon that, right? That that was was, uh, unbearable, right? And this was something that was propagandistically saleable to the poor, deluded British population, that there were German atrocities starting up in in Belgium. It's clear well, that it's well, like the, inv- like invaded- the German invasion of Poland uh, only a few years later. Well, no, I mean, that was real. This is, this, is, um, this is largely a fraud in the sense that the British and the French would have violated Belgium within a couple of hours if the Germans hadn't. And Gray considered that he, it was Christmas for Gray when Germany invaded Belgium because that gave him the issue that he needed. And that's what we have to talk about. The, um, the British marked yesterday by having the lights out power. They turned out the lights at the House of Commons, that Millennium Ferris wheel that they have, many public buildings. They turned the lights out for an hour. And this is to recall the speech or statement by Earl Grey where he says, the lights are going out across Europe 
we will not see them again in our lifetime. Now, this is a Hello, Dr. Tarpley, are you there? I'm sorry, I, I thought there was a, there was a, a, dial, a, a ringing in the line. No, we're there. waiting for you. Go ahead. Okay, fine. So, uh, yesterday they had this, this lights out. Now, remember, when an Englishman says Europe, that doesn't mean England. That means Europe. It means Wags begin at Calais, right? It means over there. So it means what everything Gray but was really England. Doing, I think he was gloating. He was saying, aha. Over there on the continent, the lights are going out, and we won't see them reilluminated again in our lifetimes. But that, what does that mean to us? That's not our problem. Remember, the British have a very peculiar view. The famous headline is, one night there was a tremendous fog in the English Channel. And the headline in the British papers the next day was, Fog Blocks Channel, Continent Isolated. <laughs> well, of course, they, they, you know, the rather larger side is the, is the continental side. That's pretty good. And let me guess, during that fog, Jack the Ripper was uh, having a good time. Well, Tom, I can see you're in a madcap mood. Uh, but the, the thing then is, um, yesterday they also had some events. They had um, in Belgium, as well as in Scotland and in England, they had a number of uh, commemorative events. So this is a big theme if you were a devotee of the BBC, right? This was their big theme. Or yesterday, the French treated it, it as the you know what, Doctor Topley. If I may interject just for a second, these anniversaries actually are you know sort of momentous right now because you know we also just had the anniversary of the end of World War II, and it was marked in places like the Ukraine and Russia where they had tremendous uh, sacrifice, way greater than uh, the American army and uh, and or the British uh, and the Allies. Face in Western sure, Europe. So these, sure. these anniversaries are no joke, are they? Well, we also have the Civil War, but let's leave this let's leave this aside for the moment. The news, what's the big news? The London Daily Telegraph, I right? think the, the uh, you know, the brainwashing of the British upper middle class, I suppose, by now. Um, they have a diary from a relative of this guy, Sir Edward Gray, or Gray, the foreign secretary. And it's from one of the relatives who says, here's what Edward Gray, Uncle Edward, I think, tells me he was doing at when the Great War broke out. And he said he was told, Earl Gray was told on August 2nd, you have got to find a way, Gray, by King Edward, by King, King George V. So, in other words, the son of Edward VII, and the younger brother of Jack the Ripper tells the foreign secretary, you have got to find a way, Gray. And the context is, Gray is saying to him, you know, I'm racking my brain, and I can't come up with a reason why the English should want to go to war and have all these tremendous sacrifices over this. And the king then says to him, essentially, that's your job, right? You've got to find a way, Gray. And, of course, Gray finds a way the following morning when the Germans go into Belgium and he says, thank God, my, my cause is now, you know, it's, uh, successful. It is interesting, though, that in the afternoon of the, this August 2nd, the same day the king says, you've got to find a way to convince people for war and carry the House of Commons with you, that afternoon, Gray activated the naval convention between Britain and France by which the French would transfer their entire fleet into the Mediterranean so they would uh, deal with the Austria-Hungary Navy in Trieste, Italy. That was their port, because the Austrians were thought to want to have an attack uh, into southern Russia through the Black Sea, right? the areas that were Ukraine, right? the, the areas that we're looking at right now. And then on the morning of August 3rd, before Gray gave his speech to the House of Commons, Gray uh, activated the British Expeditionary Force. That is, 160,000 men that were then on their way to very far northern France, right at the Belgian border. And they would then, they were going to land in France and then go right across into Belgium without waiting to be 
invited. So, but the big uh, Dr. Is- Topley, two quick points of order for your commentary, please, because uh, we, we really appreciate this. First of all, when you talk about that geographically, that part, you, you're, you're leaving out the uh, Ottoman Turkish Empire who were dragged along, right? You're talking about the Dardanelles, the Bosphorus, you know, uh, that leads to Gallipoli and the horrible slaughter that happened there, okay? Number one. Number yeah. two, isn't it? And, and the downfall, by the way, of Winston Churchill, <laughs> at least temporary, but until World War II, and others who were all behind that. Enough. Right. So, so, so one more thing, though. Isn't it fair to say, please, uh, because we want to take advantage of your, your knowledge here on the subject, it's fair to say, right, that the British aristocracy did not know the depth of the bloodletting that they were walking into with the modern mechanized warfare post United States Civil War with the machine gun and so forth that they, they, they didn't walk into this knowing that the stakes were so high, did they? No, probably not. But see, what you've got to do, though, is to see that the British people are themselves the victims of this very small cabal. In other words, the people who actively want war and are in a position to make that stick, King George V, Edward Grey, Sir Jackie Fisher, the, the uh, head of the Royal Navy, uh, a, um, a couple of ministers, Haldane was the Secretary of War, people like this. But the interesting thing about George V was that he had proposed, he had actually promised the German royal house, the emperor, William II, Kaiser Wilhelm, he promised him twice that Britain would stay out of the war. There's a letter on July 26th. All right, hold on. We're going to get right back to this after the break. After the break, good friends, uh, you know, it's always uh, a pleasure. We always... uh have a great stimulation knowledge exchange when Dr. Tarpley's on the show. We've got one more segment. Webster, maybe we can have you back on later this week or early next because there's so much that we didn't even get to yet. But let me hand it back to you. We've got one more segment. Let, let's finish up with World War One, And then I know you've got some really interesting things to tell us yeah, about. Precisely. So let's do that. Let's go. But, but, but the question arose about the British ruling class, right? And the problem is, of course, they were decimated uh, on these, uh, you know, fields of Flanders, which was the British sector, right? These battles of Ypres and Passchendaele and such places, right? The British had huge losses. Now, did the British oligarch know that was coming? I guess they did not. You got to remember, their history was the British put an army into Europe with Wellington, right, at the time of Napoleon, and, they, you know, they had... A lot of those were Scottish Highlanders who got killed, right? That was their cannon fodder, right? The poor Irish and, and, the, and the Scots uh, were used by the British for that. But then, of course, since the officers were all from the upper class, uh, the aristocracy of them got killed. So now here's the thing. You go through the whole 19th century, you have the Royal Navy, which does not really have any huge battles, and then you've got a very small colonial army, which is in India. But they, they, for example, they sent an expeditionary force into Afghanistan, which was totally annihilated, right? Remember, one guy got out because the, the, uh, the Mujahideen wanted him to be able to tell the story. So this is the fascinating... H- hence the famous expression, Afghanistan is easy to go in, but hard to get out, right? Yes, I suppose so. So that's, I think that's at least some, some idea... Uh, and you got to remember that the clique that's imposing war is a tiny, isolated group. Again, it's the Edward the Seventh Network and and a few more. But uh, they, the they neocons of their day. They also have the, they have the media, right? They have the uh, Fleet Street, the press, in particular. Yellow journalism, jingoism is coined at Lord, that time. No, the guy's name is Lord Northcliffe, and he's got all the papers. And they have a huge industry, a cottage industry of um, scenario novels, how the Germans are going to invade England with, with ships, with dirigibles, with balloons, with airplanes. As soon as you have Blériot flying across the English Channel, they have that. Right. All right. So they have all these things. With, so with the subtitle being how the Hun is going to impregnate our women and dilute the master right. race. Okay, Tom, I can see you're in a, in a wild mood. But the... Uh, <laughs> The thing, the, the hypocrisy of King George V, if he tells his own foreign secretary, you have to find a way to get us into war, in effect, 
That, of course, violates what they laughingly refer to as the British Constitution. Right? Now, you, once, you, once they say Constitution, you want to say, well, uh, can I see it? Where is it written? Oh, of course, it's not written. It's a bunch of... <laughs> the Magna the Carta. Secret. The Magna Carta, yeah. And then there are secret precedents that you can't see. And the Magna Carta is not what you think it is. It's, it's, it's a charter for civil war. That's what right. the Magna Carta is. All right. So we just remember that George V had posed as a neutral mediator and had actually assured the German emperor, William II, on July 26th and, I believe, on July 29th. And July 29th is important. In other words, even after Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and even after Russia had started uh, a lot of uh, you know warlike noises anyway, he's willing, George V is willing to write to a member of the, of the German imperial family, saying, we will not be a part of this war. We are going to mediate. And this was fed to poor, deluded Kaiser Wilhelm, who was uh, not so much the monster that people think as a, a fool, a weak, deluded, suggestible, erratic, uh, unstable uh, individual. All right, so we have all this. Now, the other date, which can then lead us into the modern time, on the 2nd of August, when things got ugly, Germany looked around and they said, who could our allies be? And they, they sent an envoy to Italy saying, hey, are you going to live up to your commitments under the Triple Alliance? Right? The answer was no. Uh, they sent an envoy to Bulgaria, to Romania. Right? They were looking for other countries. Spain. Turkey? They tried Turkey? Spain. Turkey? Yeah, and then Turkey is the one we're going to get to. Turkey is the one that, that, that panned out. I just want to mention Spain. Spain would have had every reason to say, great, we'll be in it. We'll get Gibraltar back. We'll get those damn British out of Gibraltar. But Edward VII had already fixed that with the uh, dynastic uh, policy of the royal family. He'd gotten marriages going. But then we get the Ottoman Empire, and this is a big one. The entire Middle East crisis that we've been living through now for decades comes from the fact that the Ottoman Empire joined Germany and Austria-Hungary. That became the central Because they were powers. so frightened of the British, no? <clears throat> well, frightened of the British, uh, to some degree frightened of Russia. Remember that there had been a Russo-Turkish war every 20 years or so in the 19th century. So that, that was That's true. R Russia more locally, but Britain more globally with their wider Middle Eastern possessions, no? Yeah, uh, the British, you know, the British had already detached Egypt, so certainly that's 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 true. So the the point is then, the the British then go to work, you know, starting from Cairo. The British have their, you know, if you've seen Lawrence of Arabia, right? They get up to Damascus, uh, and uh, and Lawrence of Arabia organizes the tribes of what was called Hijaz, Saudi Arabia, and got to remember that desert goes up into what is today Iraq. Jordan, places like this, uh, and that that then leads to you know, the so-called peace to end all peace, which is the the Sykes Picot Agreement, a British French agreement that the French essentially get Syria and Lebanon, and the British get uh, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. Right? This is the uh, the arrangement, um, and that's the Treaty of Sevres. Okay, there's Versailles for Germany. Let me see if I remember these correctly. There's um, Neuilly for Austria. There's Trianon for Hungary. Um, and maybe I'm getting them mixed up. But every, every one of these treaties, what we call Versailles, is a series of Paris suburbs. And the one for the Ottoman Empire is Sevres. And that leads precisely to the fact that the British get control of Palestine and out of that grows this tragedy that we've seen in the last uh, you know couple of decades, right? We have it was a Balfour, Balfour agreement that was happening, right? Yeah. Balfour is not an agreement; it's a unilateral statement by the British Foreign Office that that it's going to become a Jewish uh, homeland. So if we win World War One and we gain control over that part of the world, and you can get the Americans to come in on our side to save our existential threat, you'll get that. Yes. And remember that the, the, the Woodrow Wilson ran for president in 1916. He kept us out of war. 
And then he got a letter from Walter Hines Page, who was the infamous U.S. ambassador to London, telling him, Dear Woodrow, if we don't join the British and the French, they'll be bankrupt. The House of Morgan will be bankrupt. Wall Street will be bankrupt. And everybody will be unemployed and you'll be in the soup. So don't, uh, you know, don't hesitate, Woodrow. We've got to go to war to make the world safe for democracy. And, of course, it was to make the world safe for the House of Morgan and their British uh, counterparts. He, so he just said it right there. He spilled the beans, had the control over the United States that the uh, financial oligarchs in Great, based in Great Britain had over us. Yes. So that, that, there you have it in a nutshell. Now, if we look at uh, Ukraine and, and indeed at the, uh, the, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian thing, we can see two flashpoints that could easily go beyond, uh, you know, these regional uh, outbreaks, however serious. And in particular, on the, on the Malaysian Airlines, right, I think that basically you know, right, there are, now we can find out the Internet a certain amount of uh, study of this, that it looks like this plane was shot down with a 30-millimeter cannon from a tank-busting Sukhoi-25, and the Russian position all along was that they were fighter planes, Sukhoi-25 fighter planes of the Ukrainian Air Force uh, hovering around the Malaysian uh, MH... Uh, uh, did, did you see the reports, but, Webster, that uh, people were saying this was a tactic of the Kiev government to tail and hang in the shadow of civilian airliners so as to avoid attack from those military aircraft. In other words, human shields, using uh, civilian airliners as human shields. Yeah, but I would I would take it a, another step further. In other words, it seems to me that there's every reason to think that the uh, that the plane was shot down by a barrage of this 30 millimeter cannon fire. These are like warthog airplanes. They're anti. No, no, no. I, I got that. Well, I'm, I'm saying, what was the plane doing there in the first place? That it was, according oh, it to the to separatists, to that this is a, this was a common Kiev tactic to have their fighters hang yeah, in the that, shadow that assumes, of civilian was, airliners, was, thus rebel, putting those civilian airliners in grave danger. That assumes that there was a rebel missile involved, and I'm not sure there ever was a rebel missile. I think the whole thing can be neatly seen as these uh, Sukhoi 25s that the Ukrainian Air Force sent up to shoot the plane down. And that's well, seemingly what this Carlos the air traffic controller tells us, right? The Spaniards working right, in the tower right, which, at, uh, at Which at came out right away. Airport. Listen, Webster, we're out of time. Will you come back on our next program on Thursday night to continue? Because we've got a lot uh, to cover know, yet. We didn't even talk Thursday, about North Thursday Dakota or New York City Thursday or New York State. This week won't work. I'm sorry. It has to be next week. But let's, uh, let's a week from start, tonight. Okay? A one week from tonight. Let's uh, let's try. Let me tentatively, but don't don't put it in. Uh, I want to nail okay? you down, buddy. Okay. All right. So it'll be hopefully <laughs> frenzy the next Tuesday or a week from Thursday. All right. Web- 